And so moving on to the uh, demyelinating conditions. So the conditions that I'm going to go through include multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So starting off with uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, so the definition of multiple sclerosis can be pathological or clinical. The pathological uh, definition is uh, a disease of the central nervous system with inflammation, demyelination, and variable degrees of axonal loss and gliosis. Whereas the clinical definition is when a person has objective uh, dysfunction of the central nervous system characterized by two or more white matter structures. So this is the space, so they have some sort of disease in space, separated by time with no other etiology. And so this falls back to the uh, characteristic features of uh, multiple sclerosis. They have a disease which affects multiple regions of the central nervous system at multiple points in time. So it, it's a disease which affects multiple points of the central nervous system and reoccurs. So a person with acute onset, uh, some sort of acute onset disease of the central nervous system, which occurs only once, such as only one episode of optic neuritis, does not have multiple sclerosis. They only have multi uh, optic neuritis until they have another episode of definitive central nervous system dysfunction. And so with regards to the uh, etiology and the uh, epidemiology of multiple sclerosis, it affects women more than men. It typically affects young patients as well. So um, again, with exam questions, a patient presenting with acute onset central nervous system uh, symptoms, that's age 60, probably isn't multiple sclerosis, is very unlikely. Whereas, say, a young woman, 20 to 30, presenting with acute onset optic neuritis, uh, you should suspect multiple sclerosis. It should be one of your top differentials. Uh, multiple sclerosis is further associated with uh, low levels of sunlight from birth, such that, say, uh, a, a person who was born in, say, around the equator, that moves to a, a low, an area with low levels of sunlight, will have the risk of multiple sclerosis of those who live at the equator. However, if they have children in this new country with low levels of sunlight and low levels of vitamin D, as a result of low levels of sunlight, they adopt the risk of multiple sclerosis in the, the, the new country. And so, um, uh, as a result, the rate of multiple sclerosis is associated with countries in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in England, it's about 1 in 800. In Scotland, it's about 1 in 350. And uh, it's also further associated with uh, uh, infections with the Epstein-Barr virus. So with regards to the pathology, as I mentioned, it's characterized by inflammation, demyelination, gliosis, and axonal loss. Um, and so these images essentially show um, enlargement of the ventricles because of the uh, the destruction and loss of white matter structures. And you can also see um, scarring of the white matter uh, in multiple places, so in multiple locations, and this would have been at uh, multiple um, points in time as well. Um, and then this image also shows perivascular uh, inflammation, and so multiple sclerosis is associated, typically occurs in areas um, which are uh, sort of a which have a good blood supply in the central nervous system, so perivascular areas. In this image, you can see demyelination and the loss of uh, uh, illegal dendrocytes. And in this image, as a result of the inflammation and destruction of illegal dendrocytes, you have a um, scarring process, which um, is mediated by uh, astrocytes, uh, which leads to gliosis and replacement of um, nervous tissue with the scar tissue. Um, because uh, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition, it's associated with the production of antibodies against particular proteins, and these are myelin basic protein and myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. And so it's production of antibodies against oligodendrocytes and a loss of myelin leading to demyelination. And so um, the clinical subtypes of multiple sclerosis, there's uh, a <clears throat> benign multiple sclerosis, relapse remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and progressive relapsing. And so benign uh, multiple sclerosis is quite rare. 
Um, this is usually um, in patients who have uh, who are stable throughout their life with random relapses of, of, the, of the multiple sclerosis with no progression of the disease. Um, it's um, So over, say, a period of 10 to 20 years, they don't have any sort of progression of the disease. They don't have any sort of a permanent disability or loss of central nervous system function. Uh, the most common form of multiple sclerosis would be relapse remitting. And so relapse remitting uh, is characterized by sort of unpredictable attacks of multiple sclerosis, which evolves over, say, a period of days to weeks. So they may have a, a, a sudden onset muscle weakness or uh, symptoms of multiple sclerosis, which gets worse over a week before it gets better. However, in between these discrete attacks, uh, they tend to have complete recovery without any uh, 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 any disease process, without, without any uh, further symptoms. Um, in some patients with a uh, relapse remitting uh, multiple sclerosis, um, they may develop something which is known as secondary progressive. And so, for example, this image shows what is initially re relapse remitting. So they have uh, an episode here with no symptoms and then another episode. And then they have secondary progressive where they have progressive um, development of the disease without relapses. So say uh, muscle weakness, which doesn't get better and then gets worse over time. And... Um, this the risk of a person with relapse remitting multiple sclerosis um, developing secondary progressive is about two percent per year. So two percent of those with relapse remitting will develop uh, secondary progressive every year. And then there's also primary progressive, such that um, from the onset of the first episode of uh, central nervous system dysfunction, they have progressive weakness or progressive um, deterioration of uh, the central nervous system. Um, and they may have superimposed attacks in which they have a uh, uh, exacerbation of symptoms um, at some point in time. This is this tends to occur in patients at a, an older age, around the, the age of forty, um, and is more equally distributed between men and uh, and women. Um, and then with progressive relapsing, they have a progressive uh, deterioration of the disease, with a uh, discrete episodes of worsening of the symptoms, which then gets better, without um. um uh, uh, with the, without the entire disease getting better, which is shown in this diagram. So over time, it gets worse. Then they have a discrete episode, but it doesn't get be it gets better, but doesn't completely recover. Then they have another discrete episode, it gets a bit better, but doesn't um, completely recover. Whereas with pro with primary progressive, they have the disease progress um, process, which gets um, worse over time. It may fluctuate in um, severity, but then they may have a sudden increase which is the difference between progressive relapsing and uh, primary progressive. And so um, with regards to the clinical features of multiple sclerosis, because it affects um, some, um, a wide range of central nervous system structures, there tends to be a very wide range of presentations which may be somewhat nonspecific. However, there are key features that you're meant to look, you, you should look out for in a person with multiple sclerosis. And these are the ophthalmic manifestations brainstem manifestations, myelopathic manifestations, sensory and cognitive. And in particular, things which are typically seen in multiple sclerosis are sensory loss, optic neuritis, weakness, paresthesia, and so on. And in particular, uh, optic neuritis, um, this is a typical exam question, 20 to 30 year old female comes in, she's noticed that she finds it difficult to look through her eye, she has um, pain on the movements of the, uh, uh, on the movement of her eye, and um, you assess her visual fields and you notice that there's a central scotoma, so a loss of uh, vision in the center of her visual field on one, on one side. Um, and then you decide to do a, uh, uh, the RAPD test and it shows that um, there's RAPD on one side. And so what um, RAPD is, is um, the relative afferent pupillary defect. And as a result of demyelination, you have a um, uh, the conduction of impulses through the nerves is slowed down, such that, say, if you were to shine a light in a person's left eye, you would expect both um, pupils to constrict. If you then swing the uh, light over to the right eye, you would then expect both pupils to constrict, but in a person with optic neuritis, because the speed of conduction is slow, the pupils will dilate before the impulse which sends information saying that there's light going through the left pu the left eye reaches the central nervous system in order to 
cause constriction of the pupil. Um, furthermore, um, they tend to have papillitis, and this is this is um, essentially inflammation of the optic disc, which is shown here. So, for example, if you do it. Uh, ophthalmoscopy you would show you would see that the optic disc is enlarged and uh, swollen however um, in some patients there may not be papillitis this doesn't mean that they don't have optic neuritis this means they have something which is known as retrobulbar neuritis in which you have inflammation of the optic nerve before it reaches the eyeball um, and then uh, so there's something known as the Uthoff's phenomena uh, this is seen with other symptoms in multiple sclerosis, in which you have worsening of symptoms, which is associated with heat. So the patient may complain that when they do exercise or on a hot day or in a hot bath, the vision is particularly particularly bad, or the weakness or sensory symptoms are especially bad. Uh, and then um, there's also something known as the Pulfrich effect. And again, this is to do with the uh, delay in the conduction of uh, uh, information through the optic nerve, where they have a disorientation in the perception of distance, and so one of the ways that your brain is able to tell the uh, how far away certain things are that are moving towards you is the um, latency between uh, impulses coming through the left and right eye, such that um, if you if there's something coming towards you from the right side, because of the small um, difference in time that it takes for light to reach your right eye compared to the left, you're able to tell, oh, it's coming from that side. However, in people with optic neuritis, because the speed of conduction is slowed in one side, there's a bit of confusion with regards to how fast things are coming towards you. And so patients may um, complain that uh, when they're driving around, it seems as if the road is curved or cars are coming towards them, but they don't. Um, and so this is the Pulfrich effect. Um, uh, optic neuritis typically affects only one side, only one eye, uh, so uh, unilateral. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, multiple, multiple sclerosis isn't the only cause of optic neuritis. It can also be seen in Lyme disease, so uh, tick bites, syphilis, so neurosyphilis, and people with B12 deficiency, sarcoidosis, and um, something known as neuromyelitis optica, or DFH disease. Uh, so, uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And so, this is um, in the textbooks, it would be described as a disorder of conjugate gaze. And so, essentially, what happens is um, when you want to look right, your um, the way that this is controlled is with the right parapuntine reticular formation. So, for example, in this image, your brain says, "Okay, I want to look right." And it causes a stimulate, stimulation of the right parapenticular reticular formation. This causes stimulation of the right sixth nerve nuclei and the left third nerve nuclei, such that the right lateral rectus muscle and the left medial rect rectus muscle are stimulated, so that you look left. So that's right. So that you look right. So the right parapontine reticular formation is for looking right. Left parapont parapontine reticular formation is for looking left. And so the connection between the sixth nerve nuclei and the third nerve nuclei is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, so, which is this. And this decussates or crosses across the uh, brainstem onto the other side. In people with multiple sclerosis, they may have demyelination or scarring or loss of the nerves which pass through the medial longitudinal fasciculus, such that if they, um, they want to look right and they t their brain says, okay, it's time to look right, and the right parapontine reticular formation is stimulated, the sixth nerve nuclei will fire off, so that means the right lateral rectus will work, but then it tr the sixth nerve nuclei tries to communicate with the third nerve nuclei, so the medial rectus, but that doesn't work. So as a result, you tell a person to look in a certain direction. So in this case, it's left. So let's um, imagine it's this diagram, sorry. So the left parapontine reticular formation, so they want to look left. So left sixth nerve nuclei works. Left lateral rectus works. So as you can see in this diagram, left lateral rectus is working, so they're looking left. But then the left medial rectus doesn't work because the connection between the parapontine reticular formation via the medial longitudinal fasciculus to the third nuclei is damaged. So the left, so the right medial 
rectus doesn't work. The reason why they have uh, nystagmus is because um, when you're looking at things, your brain uh, tries to fixate. In this case, the uh, left eye is um, the eye which is, isn't fixating, and so the body is trying to move it back into the correct position. And then um, in this person with intinucleate thumbplegia, when they look right, there's no issue because the right parapet, the right parapet, uh, right parapontine reticular formation, and the medial medial longitudinal fasciculus that it connects to is working fine. Um, so the other features associated with multiple sclerosis include brainstem or cerebellar ma uh, manifestations, and so um, inflammation and scarring of the cranial nerve nuclei will cause cranial nerve uh, symptoms such as ophthalmoplegia. So they may complain of uh, diplopia, blurring of, of the vision. So blurring of the vision may be due to um, diplopia, or it may be due to optic neuritis. They may complain of nystagmus, and so the nystagmus may be due to <coughs> the internuclear ophthalmoplegia, or it may be due to the cranial nerves related to the vestibular cochlear nerve. <coughs> This can also cause vertigo um, if it affects the vestibular cochlear nerves or it if, if it affects the cerebellum. Facial weakness due to weakness of the uh, seventh nerve nuclei. Dysarthria or dysphagia, um, again, this can be due to cranial nerve uh, weakness. And then ataxia if it affects the cerebellum. And so these features are all cerebellar features. Um, there's something known as Danish, which is a mnemonic to describe the... Uh, manifestations of cerebellar disease. So this is uh, this diadokinesia, ataxia, nystagmus, intention tremor, slurred speech, and, hyper and hyperreflexia. And so, for example, this image is showing uh, loss of coordination. Um, fin uh, the finger-to-nose test is, uh, again, a loss of coordination. A wide base gait, and the patient uh, sways side to side. This is tronchoataxia associated with cerebellar uh, disease. Again, intention tremor associated with cerebellar disease. And then the uh, myopathic manifestations of multiple sclerosis. And so this is primarily weakness. So say a person presents with acute onset weakness, um, difficulty picking things up, or acute onset spasticity, uh, um, more, uh, because uh, multiple sclerosis causes uh, upper motor neuron signs, sorry. So it doesn't cause... Uh, weakness, it causes upper motor neuron size and signs, and so they will have spasticity, not weakness. And so as a result, the patient may have a spastic gait, um, paraplegia or quadriplegia as the disease uh, progresses over time. Uh, there's something known as Lermit's sign. Um, and so as the patient uh, looks down and then looks up, they may complain of electric shock sensations going down the arm and back. Um, a loss of urinary control um, due to weakness of the uh, uh, the muscles which maintain urinary continence. Uh, pathological reflexes such as the Babinski reflex, so upgrading planters, and ankle clearness as well. Uh, patients may also complain of other uh, features such as constipation or fecal ur uh, urgency, and, then, and again, ataxia and tremor, which would be related to the cerebellar uh, disease associated with multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> Uh, patients with multiple sclerosis may also present, uh, sorry, typically present with sensory symptoms. They may present with paresthesia, hyperesthesia, or unpleasant sensations. And so paresthesia would be tingling or prickling sensations, uh, a sensation that's of something which isn't actually there, or formications and pins and needles. Hyperesthesia, uh, they may complain of a dead sensation in the arm, or a sensation that the, the arm isn't really there, or that the arm doesn't really feel normal, or unpleasant sensations such as uh, itchiness. So a typical um, presentation is a, a woman who uh, presents with a sudden onset itchiness, which is associated with heat, so the Euthops phenomenon, um, uh, which may lead to, um, say, scarring or... Uh, uh, damage of the skin because of the persistent itchiness in the uh, uh, irritated skin. And again, it may cause pain, or uh, it may cause neuropathic pain uh, as a result of the um, damage of nerve fibers associated with the detection of pain. Uh, patients with uh, uh, multiple sclerosis may also present with cognitive dysfunction. Uh, this, so in fact, um, I saw a patient in the Royal London Hospital 
Um, and this was actually an example of quite bad medicine I saw from my consultant. Um, he referred to a that um, patients with end stage multiple sclerosis tend to have a sort of euphoric presentation, or um, they have a very euphoric cognitive dysfunction. Um, when you tell them things, they're very happy, even if it may be bad news. Um, and he demonstrated this by uh, tapping the patient's head. Um, so I, I don't really recommend doing that during your OSCEs, but that's an example of the cognitive dysfunction that is, is associated with a uh, multiple sclerosis. They have um, a difficulty paying attention to things, uh, difficulty planning things, difficulty with executive function, essentially. Um, and they don't always uh, present with euphoria. They may also present with uh, depression and fatigue as a result of the disease process. Um, and so with the investigation of multiple sclerosis, it's quite important to be quite thorough with your investigation because multiple sclerosis can be um, very non-specific. Um, it can present with uh, features which are associated with a very wide range of conditions. It can be misdiagnosed. Um, and so um, it's important to do a good, a very in-detail history um, in detail neurological examination, upper and lower limb peripheral nerve systems, and cranial nerves. It's important to do um, bloods as well. Uh, some conditions such as B12 deficiency, neurosyphilis, HIV, can present in very odd, non-specific ways as well. Um, with regards to the definitive diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, an MRI is useful. And with regards to the McDonald's criteria is diagnostic. Uh, and then evoked potentials and CSF analysis is also quite important. Um, and uh, sorry, further blood tests that you should consider include things such as a full blood count, CRP, lower function tests, uh, use and ease, calcium, glucose, and thyroid function tests in order to rule out any potential uh, differentials. And so um, the MRI of a person with multiple sclerosis as um, I showed in the, patho yeah, so in the pathological slide, you can see multiple white matter scarring lesions. And this is also seen on the MRI. So a person would have multiple white matter lesions. However, if they have, say, just one white matter lesion with symptoms um, on one occasion, this is not multiple sclerosis. Um, it's only if they have multiple white matter lesions in multiple locations and multiple periods of time that you can diagnose multiple, multiple sclerosis. In particular, um, the T2-weighted signal, you would have a high T2-weighted signal density, just as shown in this image. Um, and about 90% of patients with multiple sclerosis will have uh, white matter lesions in the, uh, on the MRI. Um, and so usually you would, you, you would do an MRI with gadolinium contrast. And the reason why you do this is that in multiple sclerosis, because of the uh, perivascular inflammation, you have a breakdown of the uh, blood-brain barrier. And as a result, gadolinium, which is uh, injected into the blood, is able to cross into the central nervous system, causing enhancement of these lesions. So these areas represent an area where you have a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so the, the lesions may persist for uh, at least a month and then uh, lead to the formation of a plaque, which may not enhance. Um, they're typically uh, orientated perpendicular to the ventricular surface, and this represents the pattern of uh, perivenous demyelin uh, demyelination. And an exam, this may be known as uh, Dawson's fingers, such as shown in this image. So, the, so as these lesions are uh, aligned perpendicular to the uh, ventricles. You would describe them as uh, Dawson's fingers. And then, uh, and then uh, with multiple sclerosis, you can also have uh, evoked potentials. And so there are visual evoked uh, potentials and somatosensory evoked uh, potentials. And so because in multiple sclerosis, you have demyelination, which leads to a slow slowing of the nerve conduction. If you were to show, say, a person without multiple sclerosis, a certain pattern, which leads to a certain um, EMG, uh, uh, EEG response, so electroencephalography response, um, you would expect the response in the brain 
to occur after a certain period of time, and this is standard. However, in a person with multiple sclerosis or optic neuritis, because the speed of conduction is delayed, the amount of time that it takes for there to be a response in the occipital cortex is longer than normal. And so this is shown in the diagram. In a person without multiple sclerosis, there is a response in the occipital cortex at a certain amount of time, but in multiple sclerosis, the time that it takes for there to be a response is uh, prolonged. Um, and then this is effectively the same thing with somatosensory evoked responses. And so, um, say for example, you uh, put an electrode over the wrist and then uh, stimulate the wrist. This should stimulate the um, sensory nerves and then the sensation travels up the arm to the spinal cord at a certain speed. In multiple sclerosis, the speed is prolonged because of demyelination. Um, and then multiple sclerosis is also associated with characteristic uh, cerebral spinal fluid analysis. And as a, because you have the production of autoantibodies against the uh, illegal dendrocytes, you have uh, raised amounts of certain proteins. In particular, and again, this is a, uh, something which is characteristic for examinations, you may have illegal clonal bands in the CSF. So a person without multiple sclerosis, <coughs> the uh, uh, illegal cl clonal bands would be absent, but in a, a person with multiple sclerosis, the illegal, the illegal clonal bands will be present. <clears throat> you also have a uh, raised blood to CSF, IgG ratio, which indicates the increased production of auto antibodies. Uh, you, would also, you could also potentially measure the levels of myelin basic protein, which would be reduced, and the leukocyte count inside the CSF would be raised. <clears throat> the McDonald's criteria, as I've mentioned, is essential in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And uh, multiple sclerosis can only be diagnosed by a uh, consultant neurologist using the McDonald's criteria. And so, as I've mentioned, <clears throat> you would have uh, lesions, so in multiple places and times, so multiple attacks at multiple, um, so multiple positions in space at multiple positions in time is essentially the, um, the breakdown of the McDonald's criteria. And this is another thing which may come up, come up in exams. So understanding um, what the definitive diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is and what it requires. <coughs> and so um, with regards to the management of multiple sclerosis, um, you aim to treat multiple sclerosis until there is no evidence of disease activity. And um, the, the, the phrase, no evidence of disease activity, is characterized by an inhibition of gadolinium enhancing lesions. So if you do a gadolinium enhancing MRI, no more lesions um, is that what you want to see. An inhibition of progression of disability, an inhibition of relapses, an inhibition of brain atrophy. So essentially a cessation of disease. That's what you're aiming for with the treatment of multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> And so, with regards to the treatment, there's lifestyle advice, acute management, and disease-modifying mod therapy, and symptomatic treatment. Uh, lifestyle advice would be things such as um, uh, not taking hot showers with your uh, with the uh, shower door closed, or making sure that if you're doing things which may potentially put you at risk of falling over, there's someone else around you to help. <clears throat> and things such as... Uh, uh, using walking aids and so on, and physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Um, the acute uh, treatment of multiple sclerosis includes the treatment of uh, pulses of high-dose steroids, so for example, uh, IV methylprednisolone, uh, 500 to 1,000 milligrams per day for three to five days, or oral followed by oral prednisolone for two weeks. Um, and so this is typically used sparingly, because um, the acute management of multiple sclerosis has no effect on the progression of the disease. Um, with an acute episode, it can help to uh, speed up the recovery of the episode, so say with relapse remitting, so they have a shorter relapse remitting episode, or less severe symptoms, but it does not prevent the progression of the disease. So in, say, a patient who is a teacher or um, a caravan driver who needs... Um, who has a, a, a job uh, depends on their job or depends on their vision or their muscular strength, you may consider giving them high-dose steroids in order for a quicker uh, relapse of the acute episode. However, it's important to give patients information with regards to the side effects of steroids.
so that they can weigh up the, uh, the pros and cons. And so with regards to disease-modifying modif disease therapy, uh, what's licensed includes interferons glyterima acetate and fingolimod. Um, so interferons, um, uh, these include beta interferon 1A, which is licensed as Avonex and Rebif, and beta interferon 1B, which is beta ferron and Xtavia. Um, so it's thought that these work by reducing uh, the activity of gamma interferon and production of gamma interferon, which suppresses the activity of T lymphocytes. However, it is associated with uh, fevers and chills and myalgia, and uh, which is essentially flu-like symptoms, and has very strict criteria for the administration. And so um, if a patient has relapse remitting disease with two relapses in the, in the past two years, and they're able to walk to 100 meters unaided, or if they have secondary progressive disease uh, with two relapses in the past two years, and they're able to walk 10 meters aided or unaided, um, and you aim, you aim to reduce the uh, number of relapses and MRI changes, but it doesn't really reduce the um, overall uh, disability associated with multiple sclerosis. Um, there's also glyaturma acetate, uh, licensed as copoxone. So this is a synthetic polypeptide with a similar structure to myelin basic protein. So essentially you're giving them something which looks like myelin basic protein to mop up the also antibodies against the myelin basic protein. Um, however, it's associated with symptoms such as flushing and chest tightness and dyspnea and palpitations. And then there's sphingolimod. And so sphingolimod, a uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate inhibitor, um, it bind, it's known as a gelenia, and it effectively works by preventing the exit of lymphocytes from lymph nodes in the spleen. Um, however, it's associated with headaches and fatigue. Um, and one thing to note with regards to the, uh, this medication, medication which can have an effect on the nervous system will cause immediate uh, immune suppression, um, can cause a susceptibility to something known as the JC virus or the John Cunningham virus. And so this is a virus which causes um, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which presents very, very similar to multiple sclerosis. So in patients who are on immunomodulation that seem to have a relapse of their multiple sclerosis may actually have uh, the JC virus. Um, and then with the symptomatic management, so uh, this is what's licensed by NICE for, say, fatigue, specificity, and so on. Um, for fatigue, uh, amantadine, CBT, and exercise is licensed. For spasticity, baclofen, gabapentin, first line. Uh, tizanidine, dantrolene second line, and benzodiazepines third line. For, oscillop for oscillopsia, which is when you have a sensation of your eyes uh, oscillating in position, which is related to nystagmus, you can use gabapentin or mamantine. For patients with emotional ability, so this refers back to the cognitive uh, manifestations of multiple sclerosis, you may use amitriptyline. In patients with neuropathic pain, the first line therapy, which is similar to other uh, causes of neuropathic pain, would be amitriptyline, duloxetine, gabapentin, or pregabalin. And if one of these doesn't work, you can try one of the others. Um, and then patients who have urinary urgency or frequency may first be uh, offered self-catheterization or tolteridine to help with the urinary urgency. So then moving on to Guillain-Barre syndrome. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is, an, is another uh, autoimmune condition, another autoimmune demyelinating condition. Um, it's more common in males than females and affects about 1 per 100,000 patients every year. Um, it's a, essentially a post-infectious autoimmune demyelinate, demyelinating polyneuropathy, um, similar to other conditions which cause post-infectious uh, autoimmune symptoms such as uh, rheumatic fever. Uh, it's thought that infections with, say, virus or zoster or mumps or CMV or mycoplasma and particular Campylobacter, so a patient who has diarrhea or uh, gastrointestinal signs that presents with features of Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, would be quite characteristic in exam papers. It's also associated with vaccines, antitoxins and trauma. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is associated with the production of anti-gangliosine antibodies, and this is associated with a particular subtype of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so the pathogenesis of Guillain-Barre syndrome, so effectively it's thought that it's due to uh, molecular mimicry, and so Campylobacter has um, a structure uh, which is similar to a glycolipid structure, which is um, 
which cross-reacts with ganglioocytes, and it's thought that production of, auto of antibodies against this glycoprotein in Campylobacter leads to the uh, cross-reaction of, of antibodies with the uh, uh, ganglioside uh, antigens in the myelin sheath, leading to demyelination. And um, there are different uh, manifestations that can cause axonal destruction or myelin de uh, loss of myelin. And so with class classical Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, it usually uh, presents initially with sensory symptoms, um, with paresthesia of the feet and then the hands, which progressive, uh, progresses upwards. So they have a loss of sensation on their toes, then the ankles, then around their thighs, and then the, the tummy. And it's important to um, determine the actual uh, uh, nerve root level of the loss of sensation. Um, they may also complain of uh, back pain before the onset of the of the symptoms. Um, following the loss of sensation, they may then have a weakness. So weakness of uh, the feet and then the hands, which progresses up, which progresses upwards. Um, the tendon reflexes may be absent or depressed. Um, and as the uh, weakness progresses upwards, it may lead to respiratory or bulbar involvement, which may need respiratory support. Um, the weakness tends to reach a peak at about three weeks after the onset of disease. Some patients also present with facial weakness, and there are subtypes which present predominantly with facial weakness. And furthermore, patients with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome tend to have autonomic features as well. And so this is essentially showing how this, uh, the disease can progress. So it starts off with a uh, loss of uh, sensory abnormalities in the feet, tingling of the hands and feet, or loss of sensation. Then as they have weakness, uh, progressive up, progresses upwards. They have difficulty getting out of their chair, difficulty mobilizing, loss of sense, uh, lo uh, distal sensory loss and loss of uh, reflexes and so on. At this point, uh, if the patient has a respiratory weakness, you can consider respiratory monitoring, and they may be need to, they may need to be put on mechanical ventilation as well. Following this, they have uh, a not necessarily f not necessarily full recovery in all patients, but they tend to recover. And so, as I've mentioned, there are different subtypes. There's AIDP, AMAN, AMSAN, and MF, MFS. And so, these are all different uh, subtypes of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So, um, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy primarily is uh, a loss of myelin. It's more common in children and in the Western world, and it's associated with anti-GM1 antibodies. There's also AMA1, AMA, MA, uh, AMAN which is acute motor axonal neuropathy. This is more common in children and young adults and in, uh, in China and uh, Mexico, <coughs> and leads to the destruction of the axon, and is associated with anti-GD1A antibodies. And then there's also acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy. This is more common in adults, somewhat rare, and uh, primarily causes axonal damage. And then there's also Miller-Fisher syndrome, which affects both adults and children and presents primarily with ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and areflexia. And so in a patient that presents with a acute onset ophthalmoplegia following, say, a viral infection or diarrhea, you may consider Miller-Fisher syndrome. And so the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome is uh, clinical history and examination. Um, and you should also do a uh, CSF sampling in patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's characterized by something known as the uh, albuminocytological dissociation. So essentially, um, you have raised protein levels without raised levels of white blood cells in the CSF. Um, nerve conduction studies earlier may be normal, but as the disease progresses, you have uh, multifocal demyelination with slow motor conduction, as this is uh, a condition affecting the uh, neurons, the conduction of uh, impulses effect along the neurons. And so the management should be initiated as soon as possible, as there is a risk of respiratory uh, uh, compromise and difficulty breathing and progression of the disease. Um, unlike most uh, autoimmune conditions, steroids are not used in Guillain-Barre syndrome, and in fact, to make Guillain-Barre syndrome worse, um, the typical uh, treatment is high-dose intravenous immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis. Um, in patients who have a, a respiratory compromise, things to look out for are uh, oh, the signs of respiratory failure would be a false vital capacity capacity below 80 milliliters per kilogram or an arterial PaCO2 above 6.5 kilopascals, or PaO2 above 8. And so um, 
85% of patients tend to have a full recovery within a few months, and even with uh, optimal uh, settings, there's about a less than 5% mortality. And so, as I've mentioned, there's also chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. This is effectively the same as Guillain-Barre syndrome, but occurs over a chronic uh, uh, period of time. It tends to onset a bit slower than Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, the patients may not notice it at the onset. Um, it's progressive, and it may have uh, a relapse-remitting course. Uh, it may initially be diagnosed as Guillain-Barre syndrome, but as, t as it doesn't uh, uh, recover, then it's chronic inflammatory demonizing polyneuropathy. And it tends, uh, patients with uh, CIDP don't tend to have the uh, respiratory compromise associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And pathologically, um, it's characterized by repeated uh, uh, axonal death and then regeneration, which leads to this onion bulbing, so you have layers of death and regeneration, so layers of... Uh, uh, myelin death, and then you have scarring, then reformation of the myelin, and so on. And so this <coughs> is a characteristic feature, which you may see on exams. And then the treatment of uh, CIDP, it's indicated if they have um, rapid progression or uh, compromisation of their mobilisation. Um, if it's mild, you can use expected management, so they don't necessarily need immunotherapy. However, in patients um, who have moderate or severe disease, Treatment may um, involve IVIG, plasma phoresis, or glucocorticoids, along with immunosuppressants.